Again, welcome to our home. Thank you very much for attending. Um, this week on my thoughts, I'd like to begin our virtual tour of the tabernacle, of the Mishkan, with the kior. The kior was the wash basin. Now, the command from Moshe to make a kior is found in the portion of Kisisa, and there it states, Va'asu Va'asisa kir nechoshet v'chanu nechoshet l'roksa. And you shall make a laver of copper and a base made out of copper to wash with. The verse continues, it says that you shall place it between the tent of the meaning, the mishkan and the altar, and you shall fill it with water. And Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet. Whenever they go into the mishkan, velo yamusu, and they shall not die. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to cause an offering made by fire, to smoke up to God. That's what the verse says. Now the Orachim HaKadosh says the Torah warns the Kohanim five times that lo yamusu, you shall not die. That, would, that they should not risk the death penalty. This was to warn that by going to the mikvah, the ritual poor before, pool before they served in the Mishkan, well, that was not enough. It did not replace the commandment to wash their hands and their feet before entering or performing any service on the copper altar. The Balaturim asks, why is the command to erect the key or placed next to the command of the half shekel? Now the half shekel was a mandatory donation given yearly by every male member of the children of Israel from the age of 20 and up. It was used for communal sacrifices in the Mishkan. He answers, to teach us that the rains are withheld because of people who withhold their donations. This is a ritual that, in fact, is still observed today as a custom that we perform before the holiday of Purim. There's another reason as to why the Kiyor followed the portion of the Shkolem. The half shekel was given as an atonement for the sin of the golden calf. The Kiyor was also an atonement since it was destined to wash away the spiritual impurity brought about by that sin. The shock stated that altogether there were 57 words that are mentioned in a portion that describe the kiyor. The number 57 is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word zon, meaning sustenance. It was through the use of the kiyor that the whole world was sustained. Now before a coin would perform any service in the Mishkan, they would first be required to wash both their hands and their feet. Rabbeinu Bachai stated that the washing of the coin's ten fingers and ten toes are an allusion to the ten sefirot, to the ten traits with which God Almighty created the world. Another reason as to why the coin washes only his hands and his feet before he officiates is that they were the only parts of his body that were not covered by his priestly garments. The Meshaluach asks, why wash before every service? He answers that it's just like the ritual of what we call the Egla Arufa, which is the breaking of the neck of a young calf. Now, this ritual was performed if a dead body was discovered in the wilderness and there were no witnesses to the crime. The court would then measure the distance to the closest city and the elders of that city would be required to perform this service. Before they would begin their ritual, they would first wash their hands over the calf. This act was done to signify that their hands were clean, so to speak, of any guilt, and that they had no portion in the victim's death. So the Kohen, before he began his service in the Mishkan, washed away any personal thoughts or desires and connected himself totally to what we call the Ratzon Hashem, to the will of God. We connect this idea when we wash our hands before we eat bread. Prior to engaging into the desires of our body, we sanctify ourselves to God Almighty. Also, before we pray, we wash our hands and we ask God Almighty to remove any extraneous thoughts that may distract us from connecting our service to Him. Now, the Amir Nema said that one who is careful to wash their hands with plenty of water before they eat is guaranteed that they will be blessed with wealth and a livelihood. Not just them, but the blessing will even extend to their children. This is alluded to by the first letters of the Hebrew words 
in the blessing that we recite when we wash our hands. Aum Tilatio Doyen, concerning the washing of the hands. Now the first letter of these three words are an ayin, a nun, and a yud, which spell out the Hebrew word ani, a poor person. So an easy way for a person to protect themselves from poverty is just to wash their hands with plenty of water. The verse in 38.8 in the portion of Ayakal states that the kior was fashioned from the mirrors that the women donated. Now Rashi states on this verse that Moshe did not want to accept these mirrors. After all, he felt that they were made for the evil inclination. However, God Almighty told him just the opposite, to accept them. In fact, God told Moshe that they are more beloved to me more than anything else. See, it was through these mirrors that the righteous women in Egypt beautified themselves and seduced their husbands in the hope that they would bear more children. They did so even though Paro was killing their babies. In their merit, the Kir was the first vessel that was used by the Kohana before they performed any service in the Mishkan. The Mamloi states that the Kir also functioned as a mirror for the Kohana. Before they would serve, they would check to make sure that there were no stains or spots that were on their vestments. We too should make it a point to be properly dressed when we offer our prayers before God Almighty. This should be observed every day, but especially on the Shabbat and the Yom Tovim. The Shem Yishmol stated that when looking into the description of the building of the Mishkan in the last portion in the book of Shemot in Exodus, Vayakel versus its description in the previous portion of Truma, we note an interesting difference. The tops of the beams are covered with silver, something that was not mentioned in the portion of Truma. Since we know that nothing in the Torah is without a purpose, so what was the reason, what reason could there have been for adding this fact in the portion of Vayakil? It states in Psalm 111, verse number 10, that Rashis Chachma Yirat Hashem, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. While in Mishle, in Proverbs, it states that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, the Zohar compares accepting God's mastery over us is much like an ox accepting a yoke. If the ox will not accept the yoke, then it will not be able to plow the field. So too with us. If we don't accept the yoke of heaven, then there is no way for us to serve God Almighty properly. The awe of God harnesses us to the system, enabling us to connect directly to his holy essence. However, this is easier said than done, especially now after the sin of the golden calf. Taking upon ourselves to accept the yoke of heaven has become more and more difficult throughout time. It's interesting that the name Yerushalayim is a composite of two Hebrew words, Yira and Shalem, meaning perfect faith. Only when Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, is in its full glory will the awe of God once again rest easily upon us. Now, since the destruction of the Holy Temple, we no longer possess the ability to fear God in a direct manner. What we do have is our natural inbred love of God. From that love, we are able to achieve a feeling of fear or awe that is necessary for our relationship with our Creator. So for the post eagle world, the order of the service, the Avoda, is reversed. First love, and then fear or awe. Now the question becomes, how do we achieve this love? The answer can be found in the prayer that we recite twice daily in our prayers. The Shema Yisrael. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your might. And these are the words which I command you today to place upon your heart. Now Rashi states that the phrase, these are the words, tell us that through the words of the Torah, we will be able to recognize and cling to his ways. So getting back to our original question, did the beams in the courtyard receive, pardon me, require silver tops or not? Silver represents the love of God. In fact, the Hebrew word for silver is kesef, which comes from the Hebrew word nichsef, which means a longing. The courtyard of the Mishkan was obviously the entrance to God's house. 
So it therefore symbolized the correct approach to divine worship. So the silver tops on the beams represented starting one service of God with love. In the portion of Truma, there is no mention of these silver tops since at that time, the people were on a level high enough spiritually to approach God with awe rather than with love. However, in the portion of Bayakel, which follows after the sin of the golden calf, well, they lost their ability to begin with awe. This then created a need for the silver top beams, which symbolized that now their service to God Almighty would have to begin with love and not with awe. In the Be'er HaKumash, the Rebbe asked, why were the sockets for the beams of the Mishkan made out of silver? We observed that all other parts of the Mishkan and its vessels were all made out of gold. The voracious Rabbah stated that the world was really not fit to use gold. That being the case, then why was gold created? He answered its only purpose was to be used in the service of God Almighty, which is the reason why the Mishkan and all of its vessels were fashioned out of gold. Seeing that the Mishkan was something that was above this world, it could therefore connect to gold's elevated status. However, the sockets of the Mishkan were connected to the ground, which allowed them to function as a, so to speak, conduit between the mundane, the ground, and the spiritual represented by the silver. Another allusion uh, stated by the Be'er HaChumash connected to the silver sockets was that the foundation of the Mishkan spirituality rested on the Kesef, which alludes to prayer. As it states in the portion of Ayetze, Nixot Nifsafto, I yearn to come closer to God. Meaning that before a person prays, they must first accept upon themselves the mitzvah of Avat Yisro, the love of another Jew. As the Arizal taught, that before a person begins their morning prayers, they should first accept upon themselves the positive commandment of the Ahavta Lereecha Kamocha, to love your friend as you love yourself. So what we learn is that the way to come closer to God Almighty is by first coming closer to another person. The Shem Mishmol states that three of the four furnishings in the Hechel had crowns, golden rims that decorated them. They were the ark, the golden table, and the golden altar. However, the menorah did not have a crown. Rabbi Shimon said in Pirkei about the ethics of the fathers that there are three crowns. The ark symbolizes the crown of Torah. The golden altar symbolizes the crown of priesthood. But the golden table pardon me, and the golden table symbolizes the crown of kingship. But the menorah, which had no crown, symbolizes the crown of a good name, Shem Tov, which rests above all of them. The decorative rim, the crown, is called a Zer, which is closely related to the Hebrew word Nazir, a Nazirite. Now, a Nazirite is someone who has dedicated their life to pursue happiness, pardon me, holiness. They do so by abstaining from wine, cutting their hair, and coming in contact with the dead for a certain period of time. A person can choose to be a Nazar for as little as 30 days, or they can accept to be a Nazar for as long as they live. So it would seem that the word Zer symbolized raising oneself above the usual desires of humanity and entering into a holier and a more spiritual realm. Just as the crown sits on the head of a king, placed above his whole body, so too. A spiritual crown sets a person above the norms of this physical world. Now, each of the three furnishings in the Mishkan, which represent Torah, kingship, and priesthood, indicate that there is a need to rise above the potentially harmful elements inherent in each of these three concepts. Now, Torah study, while is essential for Jewish life, carries with it the possibility of arrogance, it can result in a false sense of superiority over one's peers. The king must obviously be very careful not to overrate himself and lord it over his subjects, since he is automatically showered with honor and respect. In fact, the extra restrictions that apply to a king testify to the necessity for care in this area. Also, the Kohen, the priest, commands a position of great honor and respect in the community. This position can be abused for selfish advantage of those who are unscrupulous.
In fact, this case, this was the case for many of the individuals who served in the office of, of Kohen Gadol, high priest, during the Second Temple era. Now, in the first temple that stood for 410 years, there were only 18 high priests that served. However, in the Second Temple, that stood for 420 years, there were over 300 high priests that served. Many did not live out the year. So each of these three great gifts that were given to the children of Israel needs special protection, a border, to ensure that they will only be used for the service of God Almighty, rather than for personal self-seeking purposes. However, the menorah, which represents a shame tell of a good name, something which is attainable by every member of the Jewish nation, has no rim, no border. The brightly burning lamps of the menorah shine with the glow of godly lights, which can be received and internalized by all who seek it. There is no potential for any evil that is associated with this pure divine influence. There is only good for those who are prepared for it. Therefore, the menorah needed no rim. Each of the three regalim are linked to one of these crowns. Pesach, the moment when the children of Israel became a royal nation, is an allusion to the crown of kingship. Shvuot, the time of the giving of the Torah to the children on Mount Sinai, is an allusion to the crown of Torah. And Sukkot, the holiday that commemorates the return of the Anane Akobo, the clouds of glory, that came in the merit of Aaron the high priest, alludes to the crown of priesthood. The Talmud in Rosh Hashanah states that each of these three festivals has within it the inherent danger mentioned before. Therefore, extra care should be exhibited at these times of the year in order to avoid misusing their great spiritual potential for selfish goals. In fact, each of these three festivals has an element of judgment associated with it. This reflects the fact that one service of God Almighty is constantly under scrutiny during these special occasions. This element of judgment, over is not present on the Shabbat, which is similar to the menorah, which has no golden rim. According to the Arizal, there is not even a potential for abuse present in the atmosphere, which prevails on the Shabbat. Everything, everything can be used for spiritual advancement on this very special day. Rabbeinu Bachai stated that one first looks at the building of the Mishkan. You know, it would seem that it was a mobile sanctuary meant to be used in the service of God Almighty and nothing more. However, when looking more closely at the Mishkan, we can detect a close relationship between the Mishkan and the creation of the world. You know, one can find many similarities that are common to both. Let's look. When God Almighty created the earth, he created Ma'orot, luminaries, whose function was to illuminate the world. Well, so too in the Mishkan, there is the menorah, which was used to illuminate the Mishkan. When Shlomo Melech, King Solomon, built the first temple, he constructed the windows so that they would be narrow on the inside and wide at the outside. Well, this is the exact opposite of how one would make the buildings for the house. He did so since the purpose of the menorah was not to light the temple. God has no need of light. Its purpose was primarily to illuminate the whole world. When God Almighty created the world, he told all the waters to gather into one area. So too in the Mishkan there was a kior, a wash basin, in which the water that was needed by the priest was gathered. When God Almighty created the world, he covered it with skies, as it says in Psalm 104.2 spread like a tent over the universe. The roof of the Mishkan was covered with carpets, which were called Yeriot, which also formed a tent-like covering over the Hecha. When God Almighty created the world, he used both his attributes of mercy and justice. So too with the construction of the Mishkan, whose two builders, Pitzalel and Aliho, came from the tribes of Yehuda and Dan, the name Yehuda has within it the ineffable name of God, Almighty, which stands for mercy. And the name Dan in Hebrew means judgment, which is an allusion to the attribute of divine justice. When God Almighty created the world, it did not in any way desecrate the Shabbat. So too the building of the Mishkan did not in any way supersede the laws of honoring and guarding the Shabbat. 
when God Almighty created the world, he made the heavens first and, and pardon, made the heavens and the earth, witnesses to the fact that the children of Israel were responsible to keep the Torah, as it says in the book of Devarim. I have called witnesses against you this day, heaven and earth. So to the Mishkan was called Mishkan Ha'edut, the tabernacle of testimony. When God Almighty created the world, he commanded the world to stop growing by saying the Hebrew word, die, enough. So too when the Mishkan was collecting all, so too when Moshe was collecting all the material to build the Mishkan, after only two days, he said to the nation, Dayon, it is enough. The name of God Almighty is mentioned 32 times in reference to the creation of the world. Well, it is also mentioned 32 times in reference to the building of the Mishkan. So the Mishkan was a miniature world. It was therefore able to receive the Shekhinah, the divinity God, and create a place where it could reside in comfort in this physical world. Both the creation of the world and the construction of the Mishkan were brought about through love. The gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word lev, heart, is 32. You know, I find it interesting that the first letter in the written Torah is a bet, and the last letter is a lamed, which spells out the Hebrew word lev, heart. Again, a gematria of 32. The Tanhuma stated that this world was created by one God, and the Mishkan was erected by one prophet, Moshe. The Shalah HaKadr stated that the completion of the work of the creation was announced with the words in the first book of the Torah in Genesis, by Yahulu HaShemayim Baha'aretz, and the heavens and the earth and all their hosts were completed. So too the completion of the construction of the Mishkan was announced with the words, by Yechal Kol Avodat Mishkan. Again, in the portion of Bukhude, thus was finished all the works of the tabernacle. The Sforno said that just like God, Almighty miraculously created first Shemayim and the Esa'aretz, the heavens first and then the earth. So too, when Moshe erected the Mishkan first, he miraculously put up the ceiling, and only then did he erect the walls. So we witness that the Torah describes the construction of the Mishkan in five different portions in the Torah. The obvious question is, why so much information about the Mishkan, since much of it is really repetitious? In addition, we know the Torah is stingy with words. Due to the gravity of the sin of the golden calf of the eagle, it may well have tainted all five parts of the nation's souls. We are also told by our sage that God Almighty experiences five different degrees of anger. So in order to quell God Almighty's anger and to purify the souls of the children of Israel, God mentioned their repentance connected with the construction of the Mishkan five separate times. Well, with that, I think we have finished our virtual tour of the Mishkan and its furnishings. I hope you have found it interesting and inspirational. Next week, with the help of God, I would like to continue with a deeper understanding of the clothes that were worn by the Kohanim, especially the Kohen Gadol, the High Priest. I would like to end with the prayer that God Almighty should end the war in Gaza with the victorious being of the Israelis. May he free the hostages, cure the injured, comfort the mourners and protect all the brave IDF soldiers and those civilians all over the world who pr are presently in harm's way with the coming of Mashiach to Canaan quickly and in our time again now. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, we bless you all. God should bless you only with good, safety, happiness, health. Again, all that is good. Uh, again, thank you for listening. Please, if you haven't, subscribe push the like button, and please share with your friends. There will be a uh, musical rendition after this class. Please stand by. God bless and have a great Shabbat.